Hey everyone and thanks for checking out this video. I'm in front of Union Terminal in Cincinnati. Now I'm getting ready to spend the next 16 hours or so on the Amtrak Cardinal. I'll be riding to Baltimore, Maryland. Sorry it's so dark, but Amtrak only comes through here in the middle of the night. Now I'm hoping to give you all a great view along the way and share my experience. Let's take a look around Union Terminal before we head to the waiting area. It butts up to CSX's Queensgate Yard and Norfolk Southern's Guest Street Yard. The terminal was one of the last great American train stations built. It has been a Cincinnati icon since opening in 1933. It was designed to handle 17,000 passengers and more than 200 trains a day. Now, it has just one train a day, six times a week. Now, I've taken Amtrak before. But it's always been on the Northeast Corridor which if you've ridden before, it's pretty different in terms of time and comfort because Amtrak owns nearly all the trackage. That's not the case for other trains in the rest of the country because Amtrak only has trackage rights. Now, despite being given priority over freight trains, long distance trains like the Cardinal can be hours late due to freight trains. I'm hoping that's not the case today. So let's head inside and take a look around. As we head inside, we get an idea of just how grand of a terminal this is. It welcomes soldiers home from World War II and is now home to three museums, an Omnimax theater, and the Cincinnati History Library and Archives. However, it hasn't always served rail passengers. Passenger train service ceased here in October of 1972 when Amtrak moved service to a smaller station on River Road. That left Union Terminal mostly dormant from 1972 to 1980. During that time, its platforms and train concourse were demolished. It wasn't until July of 1991 that Amtrak began operating out of Union Terminal again. The terminal opened with service from seven railroads, the Baltimore and Ohio, Chesapeake and Ohio, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago and St. Louis, Louisville and Nashville, Norfolk and Western, Pennsylvania and Southern Railway. Well, the Cardinal's pulling in on time behind me. Hopefully this is a good omen for the rest of the trip. Now there has been plenty of freight activity while the other passengers and I have been waiting for it. Now the weather is great right now, but I have felt a couple drops of rain and it looks like we're heading into a big low pressure system with rain forecast for most of the rest of the trip. Hopefully it holds off and we get some great views as we head to Baltimore. Well, it'll be here in just a minute. So let's hop on board and see where we'll be spending the next 16 hours. Looks like we have two coaches, a cafe car, a sleeper, that's where I'll be, and a baggage and crew car. As it comes to a stop, you can see that little orange light on the last car. It lets the crew know the brakes are applied. It will turn green once they're released. I would say there are about a dozen or so people getting on here. The Amtrak crews were friendly and welcoming and made sure everyone got on and assisted anyone needing help. A special thank you to the Amtrak station employee who gave me some tips and a heads up on where I should set up. It was a pleasure to meet and speak with you. A few minutes later and we're pulling out of the station. The next few hours we'll be traveling in darkness, but we luck out and get a nice shot of the Cincinnati sign. In a short time later, the skyline as we approach the Ohio River Bridge and Kentucky. For those not familiar with the city, that's Paul Brown Stadium. Well, now Paycor Stadium, where the Bengals play. We're just getting started, but this is pretty cool so far and I'm really enjoying it. I just wish it was in daylight. Real quick, here's a look at another Cardinal in the same area. This train was running hours late though. It's one of the few times you'll see it in daylight along this stretch. This time it had three coaches, one more than our train, followed by the same cafe car, sleeper, and then baggage and crew car.
back to our trip. As we cross the Ohio River, that's the Roblick suspension bridge you see there. It was designed by the same man who came up with the Brooklyn Bridge a short time later. It opened in 1867, and at the time, its 1,000-foot span was the longest in the world. I'm going to do my best to highlight the scenery and every station we pass. This is a long trip, so unfortunately, it is going to be a two-part video. For those of you who've ridden the Cardinal before, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the trip. What did you expect? What did you like? What didn't you like? Did it live up to what you thought it would be like? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Now, we're in Covington, Kentucky. We'll be in the Bluegrass State for the next three hours or so. I was pretty excited to make this trip, so even though I didn't get any sleep beforehand, I didn't get any sleep once on board either. We're approaching KC Junction, and the tight diverging move we'll make onto the former CNO tracks in parallel, the Ohio River toward our first stop of Maysville. We'll get another view of the city as we head east and cross the Licking River and travel into Newport. I won't bore you with the dark countryside as we follow the Ohio River. I did make the trip up to Beech Grove, Indiana the week before to check out Amtrak's repair shops. We'll take a look at those while we travel in the night. This was my first time seeing the facility. It was pretty cool to see so much Amtrak rolling stock and all the locomotives. I just wish I could have gotten a closer view. The shops were originally constructed between 1904 and 1908 by the Big Four Railroad. They serviced a network stretching across the Midwest into Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. The facility was used as the company's repair shop for steam locomotives and passenger and freight cars. The Big Four was ultimately acquired by the New York Central Railroad in 1906. The facility passed to Penn Central Transportation in 1968 when the New York Central merged with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Penn Central declared bankruptcy a short time later in 1970. Amtrak then purchased the facility from the bankrupt Penn Central in April of 1975. Amtrak uses the Beech Grove Railroad shops to overhaul and rebuild locomotives and other railroad rolling stock. The facility was once referred to as the greatest locomotive shop in the world. The shops cover more than 100 acres of former farmland in the community of Beech Grove, which is southeast of Indianapolis. It's a major repair facility for Amtrak and supplies components to other maintenance facilities. A major reason Amtrak officials selected the Beech Grove site was how close it was to Chicago and the many rail lines connecting there. The shop focused on rehabilitation rather than discarding its rolling stock and purchasing new equipment. On average, it took a little less than three months to overhaul a locomotive and just over two months for passenger cars. I would say it's worth stopping up here, but it's really hard to see everything as they've got everything fenced off and you can't get close at all. On my way back to Cincinnati, I decided to take the long way and make a stop in Connersville, Indiana. This is the station, well, stop before Cincinnati. It's a covered bench next to an old depot which now houses CSX crews. It's about an hour east of the Beech Grove shops. Back to our trip, we're approaching Maysville and at times reach speeds of 80 miles an hour according to my GPS. This was a very smooth and enjoyable ride. Little did I know how much I would miss this trackage later on in the trip. Here's another previous video I shot of the Cardinal, but this time it's coming through at its normal time, and this is Amtrak 51. It's the counterpart to our train, and this date had an identical consist. It's heading towards Cincinnati and then on to Chicago. It comes through the area a little earlier though. Now back to our train as we start to pull out. I was lucky to be on the riverside and we were able to see the Simon Kenton Memorial Bridge lit up as it crosses the Ohio River. We still have another hour or so until it gets light. Our next stop was South Shore, Kentucky. This is right across the river from Portsmouth, Ohio. There's a large Norfolk Southern Yard there that I've done a few videos on if you'd like to check that out. One more stop. And that will do it. There's nothing here, and a few minutes later, we were on our way to our next stop, Ashton, Kentucky. The morning sky is showing signs of life, but we're coming to a stop, and this is definitely not Ashland. We're in the CSX Russell Yard. I believe this is a refueling stop, but I couldn't really see anything that was going on. It's pretty bright out now, so we should be in store for some beautiful views. The rain that was predicted is holding off for now. Hopefully it stays that way. we can depart as we leave the yard, we can see the old interlocking tower at Control Point RU Cabin. Approach limit to Julian. 
while we head to Ashland. Here are a few pictures I took from a previous trip to the area. This stop is only a platform with a covered bench. It does sit next to the Ashland Transportation Center, which hosts city buses along with Greyhound, and there is a beautiful Chessie caboose in the back. FDL 50, we can the park signal indication. As we pull out of the station, we see two of the three bronze monuments at the port of Ashland. They were unveiled in January of 2020. The one we can't see is Venus, the most beautiful woman in the world and wife of Vulcan. Her husband Vulcan symbolizes the city and region's rich history with metal and the hardworking people in the area. In the middle is Genesis, an abstract sculpture based on images from the local high school's original art designs. Collectively, they make up the largest collection of mixed media bronze sculptures in the world. Our next stop will have us in the state of West Virginia and our first fresh air break. I didn't realize it until I was watching the footage to edit this video, but here we pass the CSX first responder unit. A short time later, and we're heading over the Big Sandy River. It creates the border between Kentucky and West Virginia. Huntington is just a few minutes away. Before arriving at the station, we pass this string of locomotives. They look to be former Norfolk Southern engines. They're numbered in the 72 and 7300 series. I checked, and it looks like the first two are SD9043 Max, followed by a few SD70 ACUs, which were rebuilt from original SD9043 Max. If anyone has any info on them, I'd love to know more. I'd love to know what their future holds. Hopefully, they're not being scrapped. As we approach the station, it's part of a small CSX yard facility. We'll get to see some engines in a few minutes, but first, this was our first chance to take a walk and get some fresh air. I brought my drone and got it in the air as quickly as I could. Here's a look at our train from the air. Sorry the footage is a little shaky. I was nervous with a limited amount of time. This is also a crew change point. You can see some of the Amtrak employees coming and going. The yard's pretty empty though. There you can see the Amtrak facility and we get a better look at our locomotive, Amtrak number 129. This was built in 2000 and is a General Electric P42DC. As we pull back, you can see the sleeper car, second to last. My room's toward the front on this side. I didn't hear an all aboard call, but figured time was running short, so I quickly landed and got back on board. The new car attendant took my breakfast order, and a short time later we were moving again. We were still on time. Be the one and only Amtrak 5 sir. As we leave, we can see some of the engines at the heavy rebuild shop. Plenty of faded locomotives alongside those in a little bit better shape. If you've watched any of my other videos, you probably know my favorite thing about rail fanning is the engines. Any chance I get to see one up close, I'm always wowed. This is pretty cool for me to see all these different locomotives, especially the more rare ones, including the switchers. I've only seen a few actually working on the rails. I don't know what the fate is for these engines. I'm sure a great deal would just be parted out and then scrapped, but hopefully a good number are able to be saved. What about you? What's your favorite part of rail fanning? Do you have a favorite locomotive you like to catch? I've always been partial to the Dash 8. I remember seeing my first Dash 8 plus the Triple Crown trailers for sale in one of my dad's Lionel catalogs from the early 90s. I don't know why, but for some reason I've always loved that set. It's why I'm partial to Norfolk Southern, I think. Meanwhile, my dad is a CNO and Chessie fan. 
I'm actually working on another video where I catch the only remaining Norfolk Southern Triple Crown service left. I will give CSX credit. The Huntington shop does fantastic work. I followed a repainted Dash 7 Family Lines unit a while ago that looked fantastic. And we'll see another unit later on in the video that was refurbished here. I don't know if there are any vantage points, but this sure seems like a fun place to come back and get a better look at these locomotives. I do wonder why some have that darker blue color and others are a much lighter shade. Is it just how long ago they were painted? Thanks to anyone who can shed some light on this for me. As we leave the area and cross the Guy and Dottie River, this was the part I was really looking forward to, the scenic hills and valleys of West Virginia. The clouds and rain were off in the distance, hopefully they stay that way. It was time for the first meal. The Cardinal features flexible dining and meals are included when you have your own room. For this first meal, I decided to stay in my room so I didn't miss anything. The car attendant brought my breakfast, a three egg omelet, chicken sausage, and potatoes. The eggs and chicken sausage were pretty good, but the potatoes were not nearly fully cooked. Mr. Scott Nichols, I'm on the 129 eastbound, number two tracker. Second stop in the Mountain State is the capital, Charleston. Hi, Mr. Scott. We came to a stop outside of a slow order zone. After receiving instructions, we once again were on the move. The rain still holding off, but looming ever closer. About six minutes later, we came upon the work crew. We passed them in less than a minute. They were doing a rail replacement for a section of track. Not sure if something happened here or what. So far, the scenery wasn't as impressive as I had hoped, but I know we still haven't gotten to the good part yet. This was the view for most of this section, lots of greenery just outside the window. The rails were very smooth still though, so it was an enjoyable ride, and we're still on time. 5028 on the 129, he's going to the medium clear signal to Clear signal, Scott. Clear one, Scott. Yeah. 
We're just a few minutes from the station as we pass over the Coal River. I don't know what it looks like normally, but that looks pretty high to me. Now we see two cabooses, one CSX in the foreground and a Chessie there in the background. Well, we've left the Ohio River behind. That's the Kanawha River to the left. We'll parallel it for a bit before meeting its tributary, the New River. This is just a quick station stop, but I plan to check it out if I'm ever back in Charleston. The building looks pretty interesting. And just like that, we're off again. Now we can get a better look at the river. I'm pretty sure the days leading up to this, there was a lot of rainfall and that's why it's so swollen. It's still a very overcast day, but I must say this is a very pretty area. The only problem I'm noticing is the tracks are tree lined for the most part, so you're only able to catch glimpses of the natural beauty. I think I see a nice clearing. This should really show off the scenic beauty. Oh, there's a string of hoppers, of course. I don't know if that train was waiting on us or what, but it is pretty cool to hear the crews talk to each other. Now we'll get a few more peeks at the wonderful countryside as we're nearing our next stop, Montgomery. As we pull into the station, you can see what a small town this is. The next several stops will be like this. I couldn't see whether anyone got on or off, but within a few minutes we were rolling forward once more. Looks like a few people were saying goodbye to someone. I really wish this was a sunny day though, because the clouds don't do this area justice. We'll soon be entering the most scenic portion of the trip, the New River Gorge. Oh yeah, nice. Track me up at the 28, local 129, East Main 2, clear, Connell 1 Falls. 2, clear, Connell Falls. That had to be a Yeti push that over. Had to be. That's solid oak, man. First up, Kanawha Falls. We could barely see it from the train because of the trees. But we'll get a second look at the Cardinal coming through the area. YouTuber Jackson's Drones has plenty of videos of the Cardinals in this area. I asked, and he was nice enough to let me use a few of them to show the train in the wild. This video is from where we just passed the Kanawha Falls. You can just barely see them in the corner of your screen. That's some pretty impressive drone work, Jackson. Thank you for letting me share some of your videos. I'll have a link to his channel in the description and the comments 
so you can see more of his videos. Just around the bend and this becomes the new river. We keep snaking our way through the gorge. It really is incredible they were able to build a railroad through this terrain. Coming up, we'll see the Hawk's Nest Dam. As we continue around the bend just a short time later, we're now passing where the track splits to where it's on both sides of the river. We'll be staying on the south side. This area is known as Hawk's Nest. Jackson's drones shows us the bridge we just passed with our counterpart, Amtrak 51, heading westbound towards Cincinnati and Chicago. The park is a 270-acre recreational area with a nature museum, aerial tramway, jet boat rides, hiking trails, and one of the most challenging whitewater boating waterways in the nation. Hawk's Nest earns its name from the bird's eye view it provides of the rugged New River Gorge National Park and Preserve below. I can just barely spot it, but we're approaching the new River Gorge Bridge. You can see it there in the corner of your screen. We locked out and are on the right side as we near it. The National Park Service says the new River Gorge Bridge was completed in 1977. It carries US Route 19. The bridge reduced a 40 minute drive down narrow mountain roads and across one of North America's oldest rivers to less than a minute. The challenge of the gorge was turned into a work of structural art. It is the longest steel span in the Western Hemisphere and the third highest in the United States. The New River Gorge Bridge is one of the most photographed places in West Virginia. This truly is an incredible place, and once more, Jackson's Drones comes through with a great video. This time, we see the Cardinal heading in the same direction as our train, but it's already on the other side of the river. You can barely see it toward the bottom of your screen.
Now it's our turn to cross the river. This is the Sewell Bridge. It was built in 1907, and you can see the rushing waters below. It looks like a pretty strong storm came through recently. Several trees were down and on top of the other track. We're approaching one of the most famous but least used stops on the trip, Thurman, West Virginia. It features a depot built by the CNO in 1905. A depot houses a museum and visitor center for the New River Gorge National River. It ranks as one of the least used Amtrak stops in the country. Unfortunately, I'm on the wrong side of the train for this. Luckily, though, they announced the station stop, and I was able to get up and watch from the car vestibule. This is some pretty bumpy track. Here we can see a base of a concrete coaling tower. We'll get a better view of that in just a minute. You can see it's raining a bit, but not too much. Well, we came to a stop and almost immediately started back up again. The National Park Service says during the first two decades of the 1900s, Thurmond was a classic boom town with huge amounts of coal brought in from area mines. It had the largest revenue on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. 15 passenger trains a day came through this town. With the advent of diesel locomotives, though, and less coal coming from the area mines, the town began its steady decline. Today, it has a population of just five people. Here we see the former Loop Creek subdivision of the c &O Railroad as it crosses the New River. Today, it's operated by R.J. Corman. The short line is known as the West Virginia Line. Now we can see the depot. In its heyday, it served as many as 95,000 passengers a year. The town has remained untouched by modern development. Once among the greatest railroad towns along the CNO Railway, Thurman captures the days of when steel rails, steam, and coal were the major themes in our nation's history. <laughs> Now we'll take a look at another video from Jackson's Drones. He really has covered so many of these great spots. You can see the coaling tower on the left as the train makes its way into view. Seriously though, how cool is that horn and echo in this valley? That's probably one of my favorite sounds ever. We're approaching our next station stop, Prince, but first we enter Stretcher's Neck Tunnel. We would pass through several along the trip, but this was one of the longer ones. While we're in the dark, 
Here's a look at the distance the tunnel saved compared to following the river route. You can see it's quite a distance, nearly four miles, compared to only half a mile through the tunnel. The station here is pretty unique, and the time it was built has a lot to do with that. It was built in 1946. The design is what's known as Art Moderne, which emphasizes sleekness. Each end of the 500-foot canopy is rounded and topped with stainless steel lettering spelling out prints. Yet again, Jackson's Drones has a video of the area. He shows us the tunnel we just came out of and then the Cardinal pulling into the station. Track 5002 with the I've noticed this a few times. It looks like the cafe car always dumps a bit of water at each stop. Is that just sink water? I can't imagine it's from toilets. Anyone know what's going on here? If you go watch the video on his channel, he shows you the inside of the station and a detailed view of the outside too. Now, the waiting area features tall ceilings and large windows as well as a large wall mural depicting mining and the importance of coal in the area. The floor has embedded in it the original CNO Chessie kitten logo. That does it for part one. Part two will be linked in the description. In it, we'll see the rest of the gorge and then travel through Virginia in the worst trackage of the trip. We'll take another fresh air break in Charlottesville and finally on to DC. There we'll watch as they switch out the diesel locomotive for an electric model for the remainder of the trip. Plus, we'll find out why we were late and no, it wasn't a freight train. One last thing, I really do want to say a huge thank you to Jackson's Drones. Your videos really brought this to life and showed how incredible the scenery is that the Cardinal travels through in this section. So head over to his channel and check it out. Meanwhile, I hope you've enjoyed part one of our trip and will join me for part two. Until then, have a great day.